the CDC is investigating a confirmed case of a rare and sometimes deadly disease called monkeypox. The outbreak of monkeypox. 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 Okay, I know everyone is pretty freaked out about this, so let's go through the facts. Information is power. What is monkeypox? How do you get it? Where did it come from? Should you be worried? How do you keep yourself safe? And more. If you're new here, hey, I'm Marin. I recently got my master's degree in medical microbiology. I'm actually much more familiar with the science of bacteria, which is like a totally different thing, but viruses do also fall under this field's umbrella. So while I wouldn't consider myself an expert in this topic exactly, I do have information and a way of thinking about this stuff that I really wanna share with you. I do have to be super clear here though, I am not a doctor or a medical or healthcare professional of any kind. And none of this information should be taken as medical advice. If you have questions about your personal health situation, you really need to speak to a medical professional, which is not me, okay? Okay, so monkeypox is a virus. And just for general background, Medications you may have heard of called antibiotics only work against bacteria. This is a viral disease, so antibiotics won't come into play here. I just wanted to clear that up. Monkeypox is what's called an orthopox virus, which means it's in the same family as smallpox. That means they're pretty similar. Monkeypox is actually often referred to as a milder smallpox because it spreads in a similar way, just not as easily, and it has many of the same symptoms, just not as severe. And I know that probably sounds pretty scary because smallpox is considered one of the most dangerous diseases we have ever known. But luckily, smallpox has also been eradicated from the worldwide population, which is amazing. And monkeypox, like I said, is not as infectious and it's not as severe. Like with most viral illnesses, the first symptoms a majority of patients will experience are fever, aches and pains, headache, fatigue, pretty generic stuff. Something called lymphadenopathy is also common at this stage, and that's swelling of the lymph nodes, which are also sometimes just generally referred to as your glands. We typically think of these as being located underneath your jaw, but you actually have lymph nodes all over your body. And when they're swollen, you might also notice them, especially in your armpits and your groin. After these initial symptoms, most patients will start to present with the rash. This rash consists of what are called lesions. They're kind of like a severe spot or pimple. And I am gonna show you some images here so that you can see what these lesions might look like on different skin types and different areas of the body. So look away now if you don't wanna see that. And I also really want you to take all of these images with a big grain of salt because it's pretty much impossible to tell just from looking at a lesion whether it's monkeypox or something else. A health professional would have to sample some fluid from a lesion and send it off for sequencing to be able to tell you for sure what it is. So please don't freak out if you think you have something similar on your body. It could just be a pimple, it could just be a bug bite, it could be chicken pox. Speaking of which, even though they do sound similar because of their name and they do both result in painful spots, chicken pox and monkey pox are not related. They're completely different viruses. So if you've had chicken pox or its vaccine in the past, that does not in any way protect you against monkey pox, just so you're aware. Anyway, back to the lesions. These slowly fill with a pus-like fluid over time and then eventually open up. And it's this fluid that is the primary mode of transmission in this current outbreak. About 95% of monkeypox patients will experience lesions on their face in addition to elsewhere on their body. And about 75% of patients will get these lesions on the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet. Now, when it comes to other viruses that can cause spots like this, these areas of the body, the palms and the soles, are pretty rare. It can happen in very severe cases of chickenpox, but again, rare. And another much more common virus that can produce a rash on the hands and the soles of the feet is what's called, appropriately, hand, foot, and mouth disease. Now I'm gonna show you some more images here, so again, look away if you need to, but this infection is pretty common in young children. And while it can look similar to monkeypox, mostly this rash has a relatively distinctive appearance. It's also a much milder illness than monkeypox. I have heard parents say that it's really not fun and it can be painful, but for young children, it's almost never life-threatening or even very severe. Whereas monkeypox is very serious, especially for young children. Also importantly, hand, foot, and mouth disease comes and goes much faster. It typically passes in a week or so, while symptoms from monkeypox can stick around for several weeks. Again, you cannot tell just by looking what a rash is. You need to get it tested by a doctor. And during this outbreak, we are seeing monkeypox mostly confined to adults so far. Hand, foot, and mouth disease is most common in very young children and their families. So your doctor will probably be keeping these statistics in mind when it comes to testing an unknown rash to see what it is. We also need to talk here about the different kinds of monkeypox because yeah, there are different 
flavors, if you will. <laughs> there are two distinct groups of this virus. These groups are called clades. That means that they are the same virus, but they have a few key genetic differences. One, called the Congo Basin clade, causes much more severe disease and spreads more easily. So it's a scarier version. The other, the West African clade, does not spread as easily and it causes milder disease. And that's what we have in these outbreaks right now. It's also why we see such a broad range of fatality rate. Like if you've looked it up, you'll probably see the numbers one to 10%, which means between one and 10% of folks who have a confirmed case of the virus will go on to die of their illness. That's a big range. And that's because among other things, it takes into account both clades. The more severe version does have a fatality rate of around 10% which is pretty bad. But the milder version, which is what these outbreaks are, is much more like 1%. And as of me writing this video, worldwide cases of this outbreak are around 18,000, and there have been around five fatalities, which is a fatality rate of about 0.03%. So don't be freaked out by that one to 10% number. And also, fatality really isn't the only concern here because these lesions can be very painful, like painful enough to require hospitalization for pain management, especially if these lesions are at the site of a mucosal membrane like the mouth, urethra, vagina, rectum, and especially because of the duration of symptoms, like that much pain for two to four weeks or longer. Whew. Severe disease can also lead to complications like pneumonia. So although the fatality rate for these outbreaks is currently low, the effects of this disease still shouldn't be underestimated. I just wanna add a quick note about treatments here. Once you have monkeypox and you're exhibiting symptoms, there is unfortunately no treatment for it. So there's nothing that you can take that will make the disease go away or even go away faster than it would naturally. I do talk about vaccines at the end. That's sort of like a whole separate situation. Um, there are obviously medications that you can give for pain management, which is really important, inflammation management, which is really important. And there are also antiviral medications being tested in some patients. So some folks are receiving antiviral drugs that maybe are designated needed for use in another viral infection, and we're trying to see if they are gonna help with monkeypox, but we don't yet know. Now you may have noticed the names of these clades. These refer to where the virus originally comes from. The overall name of monkeypox is actually kind of misleading because yes, the virus can infect non-human primates like monkeys, but it's called that just because it's where we first discovered it in 1958, in monkeys. We actually didn't even know it could infect humans until the first confirmed case in the 1970s. And since then, we've actually discovered that primarily this virus lives in rodents, mice, rats, etc. But before you freak out about your pets, the virus only naturally occurs in these host animals in these places where the virus first evolved. That's Central and West Africa. That means that monkeypox is what we call endemic to those countries. It naturally occurs in animal populations there. It is not just chilling out in the wild or in pets in any other country. However, there have been outbreaks in the past in non-endemic countries when infected animals from these areas have been imported to other places. So for example, monkeypox very first arrived in the Western Hemisphere in 2003 when a Gambian pouched rat was imported via the exotic pet trade and infected pet prairie dogs which I honestly had no idea you could even keep as pets, but okay. And at that point, we saw a small outbreak of about 71 people in total. Now, that was entirely due to people coming into contact with the bodily fluid, like blood or fluid from the lesions of these infected animals, and they got it from an imported animal from an area where the virus is endemic. Diseases like monkeypox that can jump from animals to humans are what's called zoonotic diseases. And typically, that's how outbreaks originate, is contact of a human with an infected animal. Now, in all of the non-endemic countries that are currently experiencing outbreaks, there's no evidence that animals are involved. The people who got it, got it from other people. We are currently only seeing person-to-person -person spread of this disease. Now, it is possible for an infected person to infect another mammal because monkeypox can only infect mammals. And as far as we know, mostly only small mammals such as rodents, but it's not limited to just that. As of me writing this video, you should not be worried about getting monkeypox from an animal unless you live in these countries. And you should only be taking precautions against infecting an animal if you know you have an active case of monkeypox. Like if your diagnosis has been confirmed by a doctor, you should not touch or come into contact with any humans or animals during your quarantine period. And this brings us 
to how the disease spreads. This is a tricky one because it can spread in a lot of different ways. Currently, there is no evidence of asymptomatic spread. That means that if someone does not have symptoms, they are not contagious. Now, when you do start having symptoms, monkeypox can technically be spread through respiratory droplets. So talking, singing, sneezing, coughing. But importantly, it is not the same as COVID or a cold or the flu. It is much harder to transmit monkeypox this way than it is something that is primarily a respiratory virus. Monkeypox requires much larger droplets, more of a sprinkle than a fine mist, if you will. And it generally requires more extended contact, like talking loudly face-to-face -face in close proximity for a long time. So although it is possible to become infected this way, it is not currently the primary route of transmission for these outbreaks. This is also very different from what we would call a truly airborne transmissible virus. This virus is not airborne. The same goes for what's called fomite transmission. That's the infection route where you get the disease after coming into contact with an object that the infected person has shed virus onto. There have been isolated cases that I know of that have involved bed sheets, like an infected person slept in some sheets that were then changed by someone who was exposed to the virus when they were shaking out the sheets as they were handling them. But this is an unlikely instance. Now, I am gonna give you some more information about fomite infection route because I do know that people have lots of questions about it, but I wanna be maximum clear here that this is not a common route of transmission that you should be overly concerned about. So some answers. Yes, saliva is one bodily fluid that the virus can survive in, and in a lab setting, the virus has survived on objects for several days at a time. But this would be rare out in actual real life scenarios and unlikely to result in infection. I had a lot of folks get in touch with me who are massage therapists or estheticians or hairdressers who may be coming into contact, close contact, skin to skin, with people that they don't know very well. And to them, I would say, just make sure that none of your clients come in with any kind of illness. If they're not feeling well, if they have a headache, a fever of any kind, make sure you're communicating to them that you do not want them to come in if they do not feel well. That also goes for if they're experiencing any kind of skin condition that is out of the ordinary for them. There are a couple of things that are effective against monkeypox and orthopox uh, viruses in general. One of those things is alcohol-based hand sanitizer, so a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol in it. Also items that are more porous, so things like fabrics, are going to be more likely to harbor virus than things that are very smooth like glass or stone um, hard surfaces like that so porous items are more likely to be a transfer risk if we're talking about fomite infection these are really only things you should be concerned about if you are in a household with someone who has monkeypox and is quarantining and in that case i really recommend that you check out this website that has all of the information you could possibly need about how to keep yourself and the rest of your household safe while sharing a space with someone with monkeypox and if you're interested in more disinfecting tips and tricks definitely check this out it has everything you need to know so who is at most risk You've probably seen a lot of information about a certain population being at highest risk for this virus, and that's men who have sex with men. MSM is the official academic acronym that scientists and doctors use to refer to this population, which includes gay and bisexual men. I myself, I'm a queer woman, I'm bisexual, so I have sex with other queer people, and I think it's really important that we talk about this with total transparency to A, avoid stigma, and B, get resources to the groups who need them the most. The fact that the virus entered into non-endemic countries via the MSM community is totally random chance. Like, it could have first entered non-endemic countries in a totally different community of people, and we would be seeing spread in that community instead. It just so happens to have entered the MSM community first, and it just so happens that the most common and likely mode of transmission is via extended, intimate, skin-to-skin -skin contact. The most likely way by far to get monkeypox is for your skin, especially your mucous membranes, to come into contact with fluid from an infected person's lesions. And you know the most common situation where people are having extended intimate skin to skin contact is sex. So men who have sex with other men are giving it to men who have sex with men. It's in the name. That's the reason we're seeing the most disease in those communities. Simple as that. It's not a gay disease because it's transmissible to anyone. It's just that the most common mode of transmission has mostly limited the disease to a certain sexual group. Also, monkeypox is not an STI or a sexually transmitted infection. That's a term that doctors and scientists use to specifically refer to diseases that are almost exclusively transmitted by a sexual contact. And that's because most, not all, but most of them are primarily transmissible through sexual fluid, such as ejaculate or vaginal fluid. We don't yet know if monkeypox is transmissible through those fluids, but we do know that the primary mode of transmission of this disease is through that lesion fluid, so it is not exclusively sexually transmitted. That's just a form of intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact. Others include stuff like dancing, cuddling, etc.
The other reason it's important to talk about who is at most risk is the issue of vaccination. Monkeypox has typically been such a rare disease that there actually isn't even a vaccine made specifically for monkeypox. Instead, they are smallpox vaccines. Because these two viruses are so closely related, the smallpox vaccine actually does protect against infection from monkeypox as well. One of these vaccines has been tested and approved for use specifically for monkeypox, but it is still technically a smallpox vaccine, like it contains smallpox. And the other vaccine we also know protects against monkeypox, it's just not labeled and marketed for that purpose. Now, as I mentioned earlier, smallpox has been eradicated worldwide, so there aren't huge supplies of the smallpox vaccine. The limited supply means that vaccination has to be limited to only those who are at highest risk. And currently, public health organizations around the world are saying highest risk populations are healthcare workers who are treating a patient with monkeypox, people in the MSM community, and anyone who knows they had close contact with a confirmed case of the disease. And it's this last group that we need to talk about more. If you've had close contact with someone and they call you up and say, hey, shit, I tested positive for monkeypox. If you don't have symptoms, you can still go and get vaccinated. That's why the existing supply of vaccines is being saved primarily for those who have had known contact with a confirmed case. Getting the vaccine even after you've been exposed can keep you from getting sick in the first place, or if you do get sick, it can keep symptoms relatively mild. Now, if you work in healthcare in general, not necessarily treating monkeypox patients, or maybe you work in sanitation in an area where cases are high, and you can check this by going to your city or your town's public health website, or maybe you work in a really high risk scenario in a high case area, like a nightclub, for example, I do think it's a good idea to up the hand hygiene and the personal protective equipment, like gloves and a mask when handling objects. Now, I just have to say here that I vehemently think that masks should still be worn, especially inside and in places with poor ventilation, primarily because of COVID. Now, wearing that mask will also protect you against respiratory spread of monkeypox, but given that that's a very low likelihood transmission route and that the, co the new COVID variant is so much more infectious and causes more severe disease, in these situations, the COVID is much more of the primary concern because it's so much more likely that you would get COVID via respiratory transmission than it is that you would get monkeypox via respiratory transmission. Also, just FYI, the smallpox vaccine did used to leave a, like a pretty big scar, but it doesn't anymore, so that's nice. Also, if you were vaccinated against smallpox as a child, you'll need to check with your doctor if you're in any of these high-risk groups because you may need a second dose to up your immunity depending on how long it's been. So don't assume that you're protected just because you had the smallpox vaccine a long time ago. For now, Unless you are in one of these groups, I do not think you should be overly concerned. To recap, there are several really key things about this outbreak that I think mean it's not gonna be a huge worldwide issue the way COVID has been. Number one, it's nowhere nearly as easy to transmit as COVID is. Unless it undergoes some really serious mutations to become much more transmissible via respiratory droplets, monkeypox is still, at this stage, not highly transmissible except via intimate contact. It's also not transmissible by someone without symptoms. The lack of asymptomatic spread means that we have a really big head start here. And that brings me to number three, limiting the spread of the disease. This is dependent on testing and vaccination of those affected. So the moment there is any indication that something is a little funky, especially if you are in these highest risk demographics, see a doctor, get tested and inform everyone you've had close contact with so that they can get tested and vaccinated if necessary. We can only do all of these things if we have clear and readily available information about what's going on, so that's why I wanted to make this video. And I really hope it's been helpful. As with everything in science and medicine, our understanding of what's going on is going to constantly evolve. Some of this data that I've mentioned in this video might change. I've compiled the most up-to-date information I could find so far, but this can always turn on a dime. So if anything really big happens, I'll make sure that I update you and you can follow me on my other platforms for more informal updates. But for now, I hope you just stay safe, stay smart, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.